maybe. I think. Too much? More feathers? Oh, but I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> The most important question, and the, the one that Mum would be most focused on too, is what to wear tomorrow. I think this is pretty fantastic. Because I've got to look smashing, because Mum would absolutely want that. <laughs> Everyone to look fabulous and celebrate her wonderful life. Well, Mum's memorial is tomorrow morning. I can't believe it, at, at, at 11 a.m. Scanning, scanning, scanning. Right, Jerry's girls, fantastic. It's really the end of an era. It's massive. I feel like I've kind of kept this sadness in my heart for such a long time and thought, Mum's OK. But now it's it's huge, really. It's the release. Jeannie Little's level of fame was something the likes of which I've not seen with many other Australian television personalities. She was the full-blown, gold-standard celebrity. Can I just think Mark was who we all adore? I think if you knew Jeannie was on the show, you'd wonder what on earth she was going to get up to today because she'd be always up to something. There was nothing ever predictable about Jean's performance. These are absolutely fantastic coat hangers. <laughs> <laughs> This is absolutely fantastic, in, so, so that we girls can have a man in the wardrobe. <laughs> this okay. is yeah. I do think that Jeannie deserves her place in the comedy pantheon in Australia with people like Norman Gunston. She was unique, she was remarkable. She owns her place and she deserves her place. <laughs> I knew I grew up in unusual circumstances in a very interesting house, but it wasn't until much later that it all came out, that there were secrets that I hadn't known about. When I found out, it was a shock to me. Only in the last few years, there've been a few revelations, some fascinating things about my parents' past that has made me rethink my whole family and the world that I grew up in. It's like my whole childhood and history is like this puzzle. There's some great puzzle pieces in there, but some of the key ones are not in there. So it's just, it's just left to me to think, gosh, I wish I had some of those answers. I do really feel like I grew up in almost a theatrical production. I grew up in this big, tall terrace house and my bedroom was on the top floor with my mother's sewing room. So we lived in this crazy creative mess where mum was sort of sewing until midnight or 1am, making all these incredible outfits. And then down in the basement was my father's business and he was an interior designer. My mother was a tailoress and I think that that rubbed off on me. When I was about seven, I came out wearing a pair of slacks and my mother said, where did you get those? And I said, oh, I cut up one of the blankets. And she wasn't cross, she just thought, oh, aren't they wonderful? So Christmas morning I woke up and there was a little sewing machine. And, you know, I just loved sewing from that moment. When Mum was very young, she did have a terrible stutter to the point she could barely speak and she was extremely shy. I think she even ended up going to like a psychiatric ward to be able to learn how to speak and get through her stutter. So she was taught to slow down and extend her words to get them out and sort of say, hello, darling, you know, that she could actually get them out and start speaking. So that's really the origin of Mum's incredibly unique voice. I went to business college and it was a good career move for me because I always wanted to go to London. I think it was 1966. It was the time when fashion had gone mad. Anyone could wear anything, I think, and I think that influenced me greatly. And I had my hair cut short on one side and long on the other. I just love fashion, being first with the latest, and I hate people like being 
in sort of boring clothes and I just think you have to show some other side to you that sort of shows your personality. Jeannie was part of a group of, of young people who had dreams of uh, doing much more than just working in an office or, you know, working in a shop somewhere. Well, I think anybody that met Jean thought that she was destined to be a performer. She was going to break out. It was just a matter of somebody recognising it and also presenting the opportunity. So the story goes that my parents met at a party. Mum was wearing a clear plastic dress with plastic flowers stuck all over it. So I think my father was always left very intrigued, saying, who is that interesting woman? <laughs> Barry was a larger-than-life personality as well. He'd been a model. He'd had a fascinating backstory. He'd been photographed by Helmut Newton. He took me for dinner and it all happened. And I really didn't ever like anyone else. Really had always thought of Barry as being the only person that I really adored. Well, I actually, uh, Barry and I decided to get married and it was just a mad, mad wedding. And someone said to Barry, life will never be dull married to Jeannie. <laughs> I just kind of always thought Jeannie was a complete individual, something that's very rare in Australia, to be yourself and to be an original. And I always felt that she had great potential. The story of how Mum fell onto TV is the most wonderful story. This is 1974. She was pregnant with her daughter, Katie, and she thought, Pregnancy outfits are so boring, they're so beige, they're so bland. And so she thought of creating some fabulous maternity couture. But camping it up might be elephants parading across the front. It might be a dartboard. And one day, she appeared in the Daily Mirror in a fashion spread. And then just as pure luck would have it, a guest sort of dropped out of the Mike Walsh show, which was the, you know, biggest rating TV, daytime TV show at the time. And so backstage they were all going, oh my goodness, you know, running through, who can we put, and she looks fun, stick that woman in a taxi. Let's join the most controversial show in Australia today, The Mike Walsh Show. <laughs> the very latest in fashion, girls. Would you welcome the one and only Jeannie Little. They threw me straight onto national television and I said, hello, darling. And he thought the producer had played a trick on him and had put a drag queen on the show with a pillow under a dress because I was eight and a half months pregnant by this. So we both screamed with laughter and sent each other up. This whole outfit costs a dollar fifty <laughs> and is um, available in sort of black and green and orange too. <laughs> right away, the phones at Channel Ten, as it was back then, went haywire with people thinking, "Who is that woman? What was that voice about? How incredible was that?" Suddenly, suddenly, Barry sort of taps me on the shoulder in bed and everything. Still? Yes, so, well, just very occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> and, I say, and I say, "Yes, my." Oh. And then from then on, she was a weekly regular on the Mike Walsh show. Darling, but look, isn't this wonderful? I think oh, I look sure. like Meryl Streep. Don't you? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> uh, Meryl has a bad oh. day, sure. <laughs> I first came across Jenny Little in the green room, waiting to go on the Mike Walsh show. She said, look after the baby, darling, will you? And she puts Katie in the playpen and disappears and goes and talks to Mike. And we're all left looking after the baby. The baby was very well behaved. And you thought, Who's, who's this woman? Who is this woman? Now, would you give a big welcome to Miss Katie Little? Miss Katie. Katie. I grew up backstage with Mum, and I did feel like, you know, I was always Mum's special helper. What did the mouse say when he broke his tooth? What did the mouse say when he broke his tooth? Don't know. Hard cheese. <laughs> oh. It was the perfect job for a mother. I sort of could take Katie to school of a morning, do midday television, and then I could pick her up of an afternoon. Then I could sort of just stay up till three in the morning doing all my mad clothes for television and dreaming up all the segments I did. There 
there was method to the madness, you know. She didn't just rock up and blather about anything. Jeannie would absolutely keep her eye on the issues of the day. She'd prepare a script, she'd give it to Mike Walsh, she'd make a crazy outfit to go with it. Well, what's this one made out of? Darling, this ha ha has a definite Italian flavour, as you can see. Oh. And, uh... but women at home loved everything about the Mike Walsh show, including Jeannie. And busloads of women used to come into Channel 9 to laugh at whatever was going on, and in particular, to laugh at Jen when she appeared. <laughs> Oh, that looks great. Let's hear it for our hat. Oh, aren't you sweet, oh, darling? If you look at footage of Jean performing, she's so enjoying what she's doing, and I think that joy crosses over to the audience watching, and she is very funny. Oh, yes, darling, what a lovely anniversary. <laughs> this one, darling, if, if everybody hasn't been getting a bang out of life, if you think about it, what Jenny did was quite remarkable. She wasn't a, uh, a you know, a character in a, in a sketch. She wasn't a stand-up comic. She just created this wonderful persona. And you could call it um, madcap and zany, but Jeannie was a very, very smart woman and she knew exactly what she was doing with this character of hers. The winner of the Gold Logie Female, Jean Little. <laughs> Jeannie Little had ridden the wave of the Mike Wall show. She had become a TV icon. Two years later, she wins the Gold Logie. And, pardon me, I think I've got uh, feather balls in my throat, I mean. <laughs> Afterwards, nobody congratulated me, and I said to someone who said, why did you get it? I said, I didn't get it for talent, I just got it for popularity. And I really believed that. And everyone was in total shock. Oh, well, here's a little gift for you, darling, for those all-night sittings in Parliament. <laughs> I hope I said sittings Girl, properly. Girls pyjamas. And um, this is a major <laughs> cushion, because I know it must get pretty hot in there. <laughs> Jenny, I was, I was trying for a long time to get a seat, and now you've given me this. <laughs> A few years later, when she's poached by The Seven Network to star in her own variety show, she becomes Australia's highest paid female television performer. They're much maligned and they're sent up in the cartoons and everyone hates them and, oh, they, it must just be murder. Why would you want to be Prime Minister? <laughs> in 1987, she had a call out of the blue from the great John Frost, theatre entrepreneur, who wanted to cast Jeannie in Jerry's Girls, which was a stage musical that had taken Broadway by storm. And Jeannie at first thought, wow, how fantastic. But then the harsh reality of doing a stage musical really dawned on her. Then I went down to the audition on the day and there sitting on the sofa was Marsha Hines, Deborah Byrne, Judy Kennelly, the greatest singers in Australia. And I thought, what am I doing here? And she basically pulls me aside and says, Craig, I can't do this. I just can't do it. I can't sing, I can't act, I can't really dance. I mean, there's no, I, I'm, she was terrified. If a sky fall, a crack, always lands in your lap. And I said, but Jeannie, John Frost would never have offered you that role if he did not think you could do it. Oh, look, what the hell, girls? Let's get this tired old tune over and done with. Get it, Jeff. Quick! Hello, darling. Hello, darling. And then after that, Mum and Dad decided that they would put together a cabaret show and have a crack themselves. So Dad, who always wanted to be a writer, would research it, find the songs, put it together. Mum, meanwhile, would make these incredible outfits to go with it and learn the songs. What am I to do? I can't help it. When that side of her emerged, I think that came as quite a surprise. You think, oh my God, she's got a great voice. She can put a song over. Relax, darlings, it's only me. <laughs> and you think, what else can you do? What else can you do? Judy, darling. Hi, darling. How are you? Oh, 
well. I'm very well. You're, uh, can I tell everyone, Stan is wearing pure cashmere. It's lovely, isn't so, it? So touching you is so exciting. I know. I when know. Beauty and the Beast was revamped in the 90s, Jeannie Little became a perfect fit. One, one of the chickens thought that his pecker was a, was a grub. Oh, I see. And so he went there and bit it. Yeah. And then he picked yeah. his a whole new meaning to cock a doodle do. Oh, oh, it? I, I mean, that's I all no I can think of. I have no idea who wants to be next. I started getting phone calls from, you know, concerned family friends and uncles that she's forgetting her lines on stage and stuff, which, you know, Mum was always a bit ditzy, but she was always a very professional performer. And so that was really out of the ordinary. What is your favourite um, number? Jeannie, I haven't introduced you to oh, her no, yet, you yeah. silly bitch. <laughs> and she'd be in full flight with an answer, and then she'd say, oh, I don't know, darling, you know, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean, don't you, darling? I can't remember, but you know what I mean. She'll probably be able to sue for a fortune after <laughs> she's gang raped. And I think it's a great... Oh, please. Oh, no, it's a great thing. Well, that's what she's asking for. And I remember in those last years of Beauty and the Beast that she would say some really odd things. She'd say frankly offensive and crazy things. And that was not like Jeannie Little. Craig had all these wonderful luncheons. When I went over to speak with Jeannie, it was obvious from the onset that she was not quite right. She had many of the mannerisms that my mother had affected. I nursed my mother for many years with Alzheimer's, so unfortunately I had a lot of experience with that situation. I said, I do know where she's got to go. I do know where she's got to go. Professor Tony Bro, he'll look after her. She came in with a daughter. Katie and with her husband, Barry. Then I did a test on her. Immediately I knew that she had a memory defect and that she lacked insight into it. I said to Katie, your mum's got Alzheimer's. She will continue to deteriorate in terms of memory and planning and finding a way around and she will gradually get to the stage where she'll need, probably need care. So the doctor was completely forthright and said, OK, you need to retire now. And my father was still sort of saying there and then, oh, but we've booked shows into the, ne into the new year. I remember my father saying, you know, she's, she was always just a party girl. And it just broke my heart. She was diagnosed at 68, which is ridiculously early. But I really had no personal experience with dementia or Alzheimer's. I had no idea what we were in for. I had no idea it was going to be so awful. Maybe in some families, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's would bring people together, but with us, it was the complete opposite. I just realised now that Mum was the glue that held our family together. And when she got sick, it all fell apart. Jeannie went downhill so quickly, it left your head spinning. From being able to function, to hold even just vague conversations to absolutely nothing. She went from having a sense of humour to being mute, literally in a matter of months. I remember there was one dinner where I decided that I had to broach the subject about mum going into care. And it was like a bomb went off because nobody agreed with me. And, and at that point, I just had to actually cut myself off from mum and dad and my closest uncles, my uncle Colin, because I just couldn't cope with the situation. I had a, a baby and a young child and I had to look after myself at that point. <laughs> So I didn't speak to my father for three months and the next phone call I got from him was to tell me that mum had gone into full-time care and I went in to see mum and she didn't recognise me anymore. And that was Jess. <laughs> but she don't wear any, just say whatever you want. Even when mum was diagnosed, dad didn't want to make it public. The longer he could keep that a secret, the more control I think he was trying to keep. Happy birthday! In retrospect, I think Dad was really just in denial and wanting to pretend, continue the illusion that everything was OK. I just think the reality was too big for him to grasp, really. I can't 
believe you didn't know. I, mean, I can't believe I didn't know either. You know, in retrospect, I think it's quite ridiculous. It was about this time that my lovely friend Craig had had a couple of drinks and let a bombshell slip that my father had been in relationships before meeting my mum with men. So I, I really had to rethink our whole family. The man who I'd thought of always as my uncle, Colin Breeze, had been my father's lover. I had no idea, so that was quite a revelation. I was absolutely shocked when you revealed that you had no idea. And I thought, oh no, what have I done? Talk about letting the cat out of the bag. The only thing is, I never thought the cat was ever in the bag. I just assumed that Katie had been fully aware that her fabulous father, Barry, had had another life. And that other life included being in a romantic situation with a man, Colin Breeze. They'd met as decorators, they'd fallen madly in love, and they'd had a most wild and torrid romance. He was a gay man, let's face it. And I came across a, a box of letters, which I, I read the first one and went, I can't need to pour myself a stiff drink. <laughs> they are, they're love letters, which I actually think is charming and beautiful. When I started reading them, I actually thought they were love letters that Dad was writing home to Mum. And then I realised that it wasn't. It's nothing to do with the gay straight thing, really. It's, it's got to do with the fact that I thought of these people in my life as uncles and to kind of rethink the way all our relationships fit together. I think, actually, I was a little bit hurt, possibly, that, that my parents hadn't told me. It, it does feel like that everyone was in on a big secret, except not me. I just wish someone had clued me in so I didn't look so dopey. <laughs> Barry Little was very candid with me about this and would often tell the story of how he came home one day and he discovered that Colin had had a gentleman caller. Well, Barry's heart was absolutely broken and he said, I don't think I can fall in love again. With that, he then meets Jeannie Little. I can remember Barry saying to me, the whole reason that he went from being a gay man to a non-gay man was because of the magic of Jeannie. That's impossible, you know. Any woman knows a, a gay man won't turn straight. And yet, lots of family friends have told me and sat me down and said, you know, after mum and dad got married, that was it. Dad never turned his eye towards anyone else. He was absolutely devoted to my mum and my mother was absolutely devoted to him. Every minute. Oh, Barry, no. I remember Barry saying to me as a young man, he would have been in his mid-twenties at the time, saying that he didn't want to be an old, lonely man on his own. He wanted to have a family. He wanted to create a family. He basically was talking about making changes in his life, his lifestyle, and he, he said that it really is just mind over matter. Of course Jeannie knew about the Barry Collin dynamic. We'd often talk about it together. In fact, Jeannie would often laugh. She'd say things like, darling, I saved Barry from being gay and he saved me from being an alcoholic. I would have loved to have known what my mum thought. The hardest thing was that because mum was sick by that point, I couldn't go and speak to her about it. I didn't want to push my father to, to make him talk about anything that was uncomfortable to him. Meanwhile, Mum's Alzheimer's was starting to leak to the media and I thought it was time to go public with the news. I was thrilled to launch a foundation in Mum's name, the Jeannie Little Alzheimer's Research Fund with Neuro Australia. I think Mum would be saying, we don't have time for everyone to be sitting around being, you know, depressed and sad and stuff. It's time for action. You know, and that was the best decision I made because as soon as it became public knowledge, wow, and every person was stopping me saying, I've got this experience and this happened to my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, my husband, my father. You just don't realise how many people it's affecting. 
Beautiful. Unfortunately, my father got sick too. He was mentally OK, but physically extremely frail. So I put all my energy into looking after my father. I'll be with you. I know you will. One of the, the most shocking realisations was that, wow, Dad, Dad's going to die before Mum. I, I remember after Dad died, I did go into Mum and whispered in her ear, and I said, Mum, Dad's died, which obviously I was crying, but I knew Mum had no clue. I was just really saying it for my own peace of mind, and, you know, if she could hear me then, that would be amazing. Jean's final years were, were sad. Um, the disease progressed reasonably rapidly, as it can sometimes in people, and she ultimately didn't recognise anybody and she didn't speak and she just lay there. And that's a terrible way for her to have ended her life. Mum was in full-time care, I think, for about 11 years. There was a lot of guilt associated in those last few years when Mum got sick. I don't think I behaved terribly well. I'd pop in to see my Mum, but I didn't spend an awful lot of time there. So I got this phone call out of the blue on a Saturday night, and then this voice just said, I'm just ringing to let you know your mother is dead. And I could not believe it. I could not believe it. How do you process that? Good morning. Always wearing bits of my mum's. Yeah, thank you. Fabulous. I just thought I'd put everything on. Exactly. <laughs> I am on a mission now to get mum the recognition I feel that she's entitled to as one of Australia's first female comedians, and I'm not going to rest until I get that done. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. And we're here to celebrate Jeannie's life. Jeannie was very much underestimated in comedy. She was quite unfashionable, I think, with the comedy cognoscenti, but it took a lot of determination and ingenuity and cleverness to forge her way in the male-dominated world of comedy in the 70s. Thank you, Jeannie Little, for being a trailblazer in women's comedy. I hope folks remember you more than being just that crazy woman in the dress made out of toast. Wow! It's 1976 when they made me number one choice. 1976 you could strip the paint with my voice. The critics thought it was all a gag. John Mark Lanson dressed in drag but I showed those Well, darling, when I think about it, I have a lot of things to be thankful for. To have had this wonderful career, and I just feel as though I'm really, really blessed. I just didn't ever think that mine would be so perfect. like my mum, but I, they tell that I just say that I'm a cheap imitation. <laughs> I don't know why, you know. But um, but every year too, you know, my, my husband sort of says to me, you're, you know, you're getting more and more like your mother every year. And I say, oh, my darling, don't worry, you're getting more like yours too. <laughs> so I thought I'd do a bit of research when I was writing the book. And, you know, I knew I was going to find a few skeletons in the closet, but I just didn't think I'd find my father in there with them. <laughs> um, 